Thank you for viewing this YouTube archive of a Conscious Consumer Network broadcast. Please feel free to share it far and wide. Check out our weekly broadcast guide for weekly updates on scheduled broadcasts. Help keep us on the air by contributing to our network support fund. You can follow us on Facebook and Twitter or get in touch via email. We thank you for supporting free and independent media. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Natalie Muhart of Crystal Kids TV. I'm broadcasting live on the Conscious Consumer Network. I would like to thank the Conscious Consumer Network for allowing me to bring great guests onto the network. I have two websites, www.crystalkidsradio.com or www.crystalkidstv.com. If you missed an episode, you can go to either of them where you can see recent archives and even articles. Today I have an exclusive one hour interview with John Kiriakou. John Kiriakou is a brave man and he should be considered to be a hero. He spent 14 years at the CIA. He was the only CIA agent who was prosecuted and went to jail for revealing top secret information regarding waterboarding. He is trying to bring justice and he is also trying to make a real positive change. The Penn Center USA awarded John the First Amendment Award in the year 2015. I would like to wish John my deepest congratulations for this award. John is also named 2016 Patriot Award winner. I'm really so happy for him. And, by the way, John also has written a book called The Reluctant Spy, My Secret Life in the CIA's War on Terror. Terror. Now, no time to waste. Let's get John on the air. Hello, John. How are you doing today? Hi, doing well, thanks. Thanks for having me. Yes, it's an honor and a pleasure to interview you, and thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to come. Happy to do it. Why did you get recruited by the CIA? Why did you join? Well, it's kind of a, there's a story behind it. Uh, I grew up in an immigrant uh, household. My grandparents all emigrated to the United States uh, from Greece, from the island of Rhodes. And, and so they were always very grateful to the country for allowing them in and allowing them the opportunity to work. And so my, my grandparents and my parents instilled in my brother and sister and me a real sense of patriotism and of wanting to engage in public service. And so I thought when I was in college that maybe I'd be interested in the foreign service, maybe I'd go to work for the State Department or maybe on Capitol Hill doing something. But then a graduate school professor, my graduate school advisor, um, who was actually undercover as a, as a graduate school professor, he recruited me into the CIA. And, um, and I started there right after I finished my master's degree. Mm -hmm. Right. And the CIA has done bad stuff. Before joining the CIA, did you ever question the, the organization? Yeah, I did very much, and I studied it in college. Uh, but the CIA underwent a, a, a real transformation in the middle 1970s with the creation of the Church Committee on Capitol Hill. Senator Frank Church was a Democrat from the state of Idaho, and he convened a committee to examine um, CIA malfeasance and things like CIA assassinations around the world. And so Congress passed some very tough laws in the middle 1970s um, uh, exercising uh, enhanced or increased oversight over the CIA. And so I, I believed, you know, in 1989 is what I'm talking about. I'm, I believed by 1989 that those bad old days were behind us. Right. Mm -hmm. And I also understand that the CIA look for people that have sociopathic tendencies. Do they find you to have sociopathic tendencies? I think at this point they wish that I had had sociopathic tendencies. Yeah, um, a CIA psychiatrist told me one time that the CIA does look to hire people with sociopathic tendencies, right. not sociopaths. Sociopaths have no empathy and are unable to, to feel empathetic or sympathetic toward other people. They also easily pass polygraph exams because they have no conscience. They don't want people that have no conscience. They want people who are 
who are willing to work in moral and legal gray areas. And to tell you the truth, for a long time I was willing to work in those gray areas. If, um, yeah, and, and I should say because I believed that we were the good guys. And so if I needed to break into an office and steal a document, or if I needed to bug somebody's phone, or do whatever operation was necessary to collect actionable intelligence that would save American lives, I was willing to do it. That's great. And when did you leave the CIA, and why did you leave the CIA? I left the CIA in early 2004, and I'm, I'm probably the only guy who, when I say I left in order to spend more time with my family, I really meant that I left because I wanted to spend more time with my family. Um, I had been divorced. I had just gotten divorced. And um, my, my sons, I had two children at the time. My sons were young. They were nine and six. And I, I thought that they needed me around and I needed to be around them. And I figured I was probably going to go overseas again, um, probably for a long period of time. And I wanted to you know, I wanted for my boys to grow up around me rather than to have me as an absentee father working in, you know, Afghanistan or something. So I resigned. You did the white thing. I, think I, I did. It was, it was worth it. It was. Mm -hmm. And after leaving the CIA, you went to work for a private company. Mm -hmm. Why would they want someone who was a former CIA agent? Can you that, that's a good, yeah, it's a good question. That's a good question. In fact, <laughs> uh, a colleague of mine at the CIA was the one who told me about this job at, at this company. It was a it was an accounting firm, one of the big four accounting firms. And she said, oh, you know, you should apply to this accounting firm. They're looking for somebody. And she told me the name. And I said, oh, that's an accounting firm. Why in the world would they want somebody like me? Mm -hmm. And she said, oh, they have this unit that spies on their competitors. Right. And I said, oh, okay. So... I had never written a resume in my life. I never had to because I was recruited right out of graduate school. So um, I wrote a resume that night, and um, the next day I emailed it to this friend's contact, and they called me right away just a few hours later and, and um, invited me to go to New York for an interview. So I went to New York and um, had a terrific interview. Two weeks later they offered me the job, and the job was to buy on their – competitors to uh -huh. try to steal their pricing models or to figure out how they determine discounts or to try to steal their partners and get their partners to come and work for us. And, you know, it was what they call um, industrial espionage or commercial espionage. So it was basically the same thing. Right. And I would like CCN to play a clip of John in the ABC News interview because this is a very important clip for everyone to hear. And at the time, I, I felt that waterboarding was something that we needed to do. And as time has passed, and has, as September 11th has, has, you know, has moved farther and farther back into history, um, I think I've changed my mind. And I think that uh, waterboarding is probably something that we shouldn't be in the business of doing. Why do you say that now? Because we're Americans and we're better than that. After doing that interview on ABC, you became a bad guy when you weren't. Mm -hmm. You confirmed waterboarding was really happening and should be addressed, as it is a very serious issue. You were just fighting for your country, but all of a sudden, you were not an asset. What inspired you to talk about waterboarding on national television, and what changed your mind about waterboarding? Well, in December of 2007, Brian Ross of ABC News uh, called me and said that he had a source who said that I had tortured Abu Zubaydah. I had actually led the capture of Abu Zubaydah in Faisalabad, Pakistan, in 2002. I told Brian Ross his source was absolutely wrong. I had never tortured Abu Zubaydah or any other prisoner. I had never laid a hand on Abu Zubaydah or any other prisoner. And indeed, I was the only person who had been kind to Abu Zubaydah when we captured him. And he pulled what I learned later was an old reporter's trick. And he said, uh, well, you're welcome to come on the show and defend yourself. And so I said I'd think about it. In the meantime, President Bush uh, gave a press conference in which he said, point blank, straight to the camera, we do not torture. Well, I knew that that was a lie. I knew that we were torturing prisoners, but I still didn't say anything. And then later that same week, in response to a reporter's question, 
He said, if there is torture, it's the result of a rogue CIA officer. Well, I also knew that that was a lie. But what scared me was that Brian Ross's source was at the White House and that they were going to pin this torture program on me. And so I called Brian Ross and I said, I'll do your interview. And I decided in the week between when I told him I would go on the show and when I actually went on, that no matter what he asked me, I was going to tell the truth. And so in that interview, I said three things that completely changed the course of the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. I said the CIA was torturing its prisoners. I said that torture was official U.S. government policy. Mm -hmm. I said that the policy had been approved by and signed by the president himself. And so within 24 hours, the CIA reported me to the Justice Department as having committed a crime, and the FBI began investigating me. Now, the investigation took a full year. And then at the end of the year, the FBI determined that I had not committed a crime, and they dropped the case. But three months later, after Barack Obama was uh, inaugurated, the CIA asked the Obama Justice Department to reopen the case, and they did. They investigated me for another three years, and mm -hmm. then finally filed charges against me. Oh, really? It was a long process. Yeah, it does sound like a long process, yeah. Mm -hmm. And could you please tell us, have you ever experienced any waterboarding yourself? Yeah, um, several colleagues of mine and I waterboarded each other um, at a training facility just because, you know, we had heard so much about it. We wanted to experience it for ourselves, so we did it to each other one night. Oh, really? And how does it feel to be waterboarded? Oh. Oh, it's torture. There's no question about it. See, it's even, it's even taught in, in U.S. military SEER training as something that our enemies might use against uh, our soldiers um, if they happen to be captured. So there's really no question at all. I mean, you, you, you get the sensation of drowning. Your abdominal muscles are seizing because you're trying to get out of the way of the water. It's very painful. You, you find yourself vomiting slipping in and out of consciousness. It's really quite uh, violent. Oh, that's so sad to hear, mm. yeah. And when I hear about waterboarding torture and your story, it reminds me of the stories I read about in Nazi Germany. I could see Hitler back. He would be just so proud. Like, you know, we always talk about Nazi Germany and what they were doing, and we always think, wow, like they were, like, oh, it was horrible. And what are we doing today? Yeah, the Chinese did it, the Vietnamese did it, the Belgians did it in the Congo. Waterboarding goes back to something like the 16th century. I mean, it's a, it's a very old uh, form of torture, and has been in, it's been used by despots over the centuries. But it shouldn't be used. No, it shouldn't be used for a variety of reasons. Number one, it's, it's immoral. But number two is it's illegal. We have a law in the United States called the Federal Torture Act. And it defines torture, and it specifically prohibits it. Well, waterboarding falls under, very easily, falls under that definition of torture. Not only do we have a domestic law that bans torture, but the United States is a signatory to the United Nations Convention Against Torture. Not only that, we were the primary authors of the United Nations Convention Against Torture. But that convention also defines torture and specifically prohibits it. So let me add one more point to that. Yeah, please do so. In January 1968, the Washington Post ran an article, on, or not an article, but a photograph on the front page showing an American soldier waterboarding a North Vietnamese prisoner. On the day that that photograph appeared, then Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara um, ordered an investigation. The soldier was arrested. He was um, convicted of torture and he was imprisoned. Well, the law didn't change. So why was waterboarding illegal in 1968, but it was not illegal in 2002? Oh. Just because one of George W. Bush's attorneys at the Justice Department said so? To me, that's just not good enough. Yeah. To me, there was, there was no question about it, that waterboarding was illegal, waterboarder, waterboarding was torture, and waterboarding was something that we, sh we should not have been in the business of doing. Yeah, it shouldn't be happening. It's barbaric. It is. It's barbaric. That's the word. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And actually, I'm going to show a clip for my audience to see it. President George Bush Jr., as you said, says that we don't torture people. I think it would be important for CCN to play this since he said these words. Mm -hmm.
a program uh, that, uh, uh, that I put in motion to detain and question uh, terrorists and extremists. I have put this program in place for a reason, and that is to better protect the American people. And when we find somebody who may have information regarding a potential attack on America, you bet we're going to detain them. And you bet we're going to question them. Because the American people expect us to find out information, uh, actionable intelligence, so we can help them, help protect them. That's our job. Uh, secondly, this government does not torture people. You know, we, 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 we stick to U.S. law and our international obligations. Uh, thirdly, there are highly trained professionals questioning these uh, extremists and terrorists. In other words, we got professionals who are trained in this uh, uh, kind of work to uh, get information that will protect the American people. And by the way, we have gotten information from these high-value detainees that have helped protect you. And finally, the techniques that we use have uh, been fully disclosed to appropriate members of the United States Congress. The American people expect their government to take action to protect them from further attack. And that's exactly what this government is doing, and that's exactly what we'll continue to do. President George Bush Jr. didn't get in trouble for lying to the public, but you get in trouble for telling the truth? <laughs> ironic, isn't it? You yeah. know, what, what else is ironic to me um, is that the torturers uh, never went to prison. Uh, the creators of the torture program at the CIA and the White House and the Justice Department didn't go to prison. The attorneys who who drafted specious legal arguments justifying the torture didn't go to prison. And even the CIA officer who destroyed tapes of the torture uh, didn't go to prison. Mm -hmm. But I did. I did. And that says a lot about the, about the Obama administration's treatment of whistleblowers. I'm certainly not the only one. There are nine others. Hmm, that's really strange. Yeah, you went to jail while they didn't. Hmm, isn't it ironic like you said? It's really ironic. <laughs> there, there's, a real, there's a real irony here, and it, it is one that carries very heavy um, uh, policy uh, consequences. We have a law in the United States called the Espionage Act. Now, to be charged with espionage, it, it's the gravest charge that the government can, can level against someone. And indeed, in some cases, it carries the death penalty. So it was written in 1917 to combat German saboteurs during the First World War. And between 1917 and 2000, um, 2009, which is almost a century, it was used three times to prosecute people who had um, given information to the press. Since Barack Obama was elected president, he's used it 10 times to prosecute people who have given information to the press. He's using it um, as a political tool. I, I said in an op-ed in the Guardian newspaper, he's using it really as an iron fist to stamp out any dissent and to frighten any other potential whistleblower that if you're thinking about coming forward to report on waste, fraud, abuse, or illegality, mm -hmm. we're going to ruin you. And that's what they do. Yes, I just see that they're going to ruin you. Yeah. But before going on to national television, was the CIA happy with you? Oh, yeah. In fact, I... I had won 10 exceptional performance awards. I had the Sustained Superior Performance Award. I won the Meritorious Honor Award with a medal. I, I won the Counterterrorism Service Medal. Um, I was a highly decorated and, and really fast-moving um, CIA officer. I had a really great career. Yeah, it sounds like you did. Mm -hmm. And Abu Zubaydah, I wanted to ask a question about him. How many times was he waterboarded? He was waterboarded 83 times, uh, despite the fact that the people who were actually carrying out the waterboarding had reported to headquarters that he had only been waterboarded one time. Yeah. And do you believe that the CIA will abandon torture techniques? No. Yeah. I, I like to – I think I know the way 
the CIA psyche is. And the CIA, a lot of CIA officers at the senior level think that, you know, presidents come and go. And we are always here. And so this president bans torture. Now well, maybe the next one's going to allow us to bring it back. Uh, the only reason why I have any hope at all is that just last summer, Congress passed a measure called the uh, McCain-Feinstein Amendment. It was an amendment to the Defense Authorization Bill. And it has, again, formally banned torture in this country. It's made torture illegal. We have the law that already made it illegal, but now we're reiterating with this amendment the fact that it's illegal. So I like to think that people will observe the law. One of the dangers, however, is instead of torturing its prisoners, mm -hmm. what the CIA can do, <coughs> excuse me, and in many cases does, is it'll take a prisoner yes. and it'll send him to a friendly country, an allied country, that does carry out torture. Uh, that's called rendition or extraordinary rendition. Mm -hmm. And so just the fact that we have this law doesn't mean that people aren't going to get tortured anymore. Right, yeah. It doesn't. It just means that it makes it slightly harder to torture them. Yeah. yeah. Right. But it doesn't really help, though. Not a great deal, no. Yeah, that's sad. Oh. <laughs> well, where were you when 9-11 happened? I was at CIA headquarters on 9-11. I, I had a 9 o'clock appointment at the White House. Um, I was going to the White House that morning with Kofor Black, the director of the CIA's Counterterrorism Center. We had an appointment with Condoleezza Rice, who at the time was the National Security Advisor. And, you know, it's kind of quaint now. Our appointment was to talk about Greek terrorism, communist terrorism, which is like a joke now. Uh, but we were supposed to see her at 9 o'clock. And at 8.15, I got a call uh, from our driver saying that he was outside uh, the door. He was waiting to take us to the White House. So I walked over to Ambassador Black's office, and um, I wanted to tell him that the car was ready. But when I went over there, his secretary had her TV on. It was on her desk, and one of the towers of the World Trade Center was burning. And I said, uh, I said, what happened to the World Trade Center? And she said, a plane just flew into it. And I didn't put two and two together, and I said, you know, that happened once before. In the 1930s, a plane flew into the Empire State Building. But it was really foggy that day, and it's so clear today. Like, how can you not see that you're flying into the World Trade Center? Wow. And just as I said that, the second plane flew into Tower One. And then neither one of us said anything. And finally she turned and looked at me, and she said, did you see that or did I imagine it? And I turned around and I ran back to my office, and I said, guys, I think we're under attack. The uh, planes have flown into both towers of the World Trade Center. And so everybody then went back into the main office and gathered around the TVs, and then the Pentagon hit, and it was just a, just a disaster that day. It was. <laughs> yeah, that was only one, but yeah, it must have been a really bad disaster. <laughs> we, all, we all lost friends that day. All of us did. And then about six hours later, Ambassador Black called us all together and, um, and just stood in the middle of us and gave a speech, and he said, Declared or not, today we're at war, he said, and we're all going to have to go over and fight this war, and not all of us are going to make it back. Why? That's and he said, if you don't want to go, tell us now, and you won't go, but the rest of us are going to fight. Yeah. And everybody volunteered to go. Everybody. That's so good to hear. Mm -hmm. and we, only lost, um, we only lost two or three people. I mean, two or three is two or three too many. Yeah, it is. But... Um, but everybody, everybody, you know, jumped up to, to volunteer. Well, I'm glad everyone did jump up to volunteer, mm -hmm. and you worked, everyone worked together at least to mm -hmm. help each other. Mm -hmm. And after 9-11, the USA became a different country. What really happened after 9-11 in your words? One of my attorneys, Jessalyn Radak, um, mm -hmm. was a Justice Department attorney at the time. She was an ethics attorney. And um, she blew the whistle on the Justice Department's malfeasance in the John Walker Lind case. He, he was known as the American Taliban. And Jessalyn really says it best, and it's really so simple. She says, I just want my September 10th country back. Yes. And I feel exactly the same way. We've given up so many of our civil liberties. 
mm -hmm. without so much as a as a debate. Um, it's amazing to me that Americans have tolerated this kind of thing since September 11th. You know, it's funny too. We we have this absolutely awful law called the Patriot Act. Um, it should be called anything but the Patriot Act. It's the Unpatriotic Act, frankly, where the FBI, without a, a warrant, can you know, go to the local library and, and demand a list of the books that you check out. Uh, they can listen to your phone calls or read your emails without a warrant, with only something called a national security letter, which they just write saying, or they write it to the service provider and say, give us everything you have. Mm -hmm. uh, NSA, the National Security Agency, um, is forbidden by law from spying on American citizens. And indeed, it's in NSA's charter that they're not allowed to spy on Americans. In fact, that's practically all that NSA does now. It collects our metadata, and it just built a new uh, facility in Utah in the desert that has enough storage space that it can now save every cell phone call, every text message, and every email from every American for the next 500 years. Mm -hmm. That's not what I want my country to be like. Yeah. I want my country to be this shining beacon on the hill that Ronald Reagan always said we were. You know, the land of the free and the home of the brave. Well, I'm not, I'm not sure we're so free anymore. No, it isn't. It seems as well it's control. And it seems like history is repeating itself and Nazi Germany is coming back. And that's what I see myself as a kid. Yeah. He, right. Why? And could you please tell us why did you go to jail and why do you believe you were jailed? That's not freedom at all. For how many yeah. years? I, I was um, convicted of violating the Intelligence Identities Protection Act of 1982. I'm only the second person in American history that was even charged under this act. Um, what happened was a reporter asked me if I um, yes. could introduce him to somebody who he could interview for a book that he was writing on the CIA's rendition uh, program. I said I really didn't know anybody who was involved in renditions. So he sent me a list of names, about a dozen names, and he said, can you introduce me to any of these people? And I said, I don't know any of these people. And then he sent me a second list, and I said, I don't know any of these people either. And then finally I said to him, look, you, you apparently know this issue so much better than I, than I do. I just, I just can't help you. And he said, well, what about the guy that you mentioned in your book? I'm going to say John. Can you introduce me to him? And I said, oh, right. I said, that's John Doe. I don't know whatever happened to him. He's probably retired and living in Virginia somewhere. Mm -hmm. Well, that conversation was a felony because I confirmed the name of a former colleague, and that's what they arrested me for. Now, that kind of thing happens in Washington every single day. Um, you see it in the New York Times. You see it in the Washington Post. Uh, people say the names on TV. It's just one of those things that happens all the time, and nobody ever gets arrested for it. Uh, James, uh, uh, David Petraeus, the General David Petraeus, the former CIA director, revealed the names of 10 covert operatives to his girlfriend, but he was not charged. Former CIA director Leon Panetta gave the name of the Navy SEAL who shot and killed Osama bin Laden to a Hollywood producer. He was not charged with a crime, um, but I was charged with a crime. Uh, now, in the course of the FBI's investigation, they uncovered evidence of another CIA officer, a disgruntled former CIA officer, who gave this same author the names of seven covert operatives. But he also was not charged with a crime. And the easy answer to the question why is because none of those people blew the whistle on torture. Yep, and you did. And I did. And so, you know, when people say, well, you know, you weren't jailed for the torture program. You weren't jailed for saying we were waterboarding. You know, technically, sure, you're correct. But that's certainly why I was prosecuted. There's no question about it. I know, but it's freedom of speech. You should be allowed to say what you're allowed to say, and yet you didn't have that. You know, and, and I, talked, I talked to experts about that kind of thing, including the former classification czar at the Pentagon under George W. Bush, and, and they all agreed that, you know, you're, you're right, it's a freedom of speech issue, but what? it's an issue that I would have to appeal post-conviction. So what the Justice Department did is when it made me a deal, they said, we'll give you two and a half years, you serve two, and you give up the right to appeal. Or you can appeal, but we're going to ask the judge for 45 years. 
Oh my. So what do I do? Do I take two? I have five kids at home. Do I take two years or do I risk 45 years? I take so, two. You know, it was an easy decision. Right, it is. So you have five kids at home. And how did your children feel when you were jailed? Uh, they, they came to visit me every month. Yeah. And, and, you know, most of them, three of them were old enough to understand what was going on, and, and they, were, they were very supportive. Yeah, but it must have been harder for the younger ones. It, it was hard. Yeah, it was hard. Very hard. I wouldn't wish it on anybody. Oh, no. That's not acceptable. And how did you feel to be jailed? Like, what did you learn from being jailed, and how did you survive such experience? Oh, I, I learned that our criminal justice system in the United States is utterly broken. You know, the, the United Nations has called the United States government's use of solitary confinement, for example, a form of torture. Um, and it's because solitary confinement, confinement in the United States um, is used punitively. It's used um, as a punishment for anything. It's supposed to be used to protect the inmate or to protect prison staff. In fact, if a guard doesn't like you know, your face or if a guard you talk back, straight to solitary. Well, you know, there are only a handful of countries that do that, places like Russia and Iran and North Korea and, mm -hmm. and, and Cuba. I mean, yeah. places like that use solitary confinement as, as a uh, punishment. It shouldn't be the United States using it, but it, but it is. I ended up writing another book uh, in prison called Doing Time Like a Spy, How the CIA Taught Me to Survive and Thrive in Prison. Uh, it's out for bid right now. I, I hope it's published by the end of the year. Oh, that's cool. It'll be fun. And so then after, once you publish it, where can people be able to buy that book? Oh, yeah, it'll be pretty much everywhere. It'll be on Amazon and Barnes & Noble and, you know, small bookstores and pretty much all over the place. Uh-huh. And can you give us a little bit of the outline if you're able to? Yeah, you know, I, I, learned, I learned these 20, I'm going to call them life lessons at the CIA. Some of them were funny, like admit nothing, deny everything, make counter accusations. Mm -hmm. Uh, and some were really very practical, like when um, when peace is not to your benefit, chaos is your friend, or um, recruit spies to steal secrets or anything else you need. Right. And what I did is I I used those life lessons to to ally myself with all the proper factions in prison to make sure that I remain safe and stayed at the top of the social heap. Wow. And it must, it must be a very exciting book. I can't wait until it comes out. <laughs> uh, thanks. Mm -hmm. thanks. Right. I'm excited about it. Mm -hmm. Yes, I am too. And there's a man that you wrote about in your fantastic and compelling article called An, Just, An, An Assault of Justice, who you called James. Could you please be so kind to tell us about the story? Yeah, James was a cellmate of mine, mm -hmm. one, of my, one of my last cellmates. James was on federal uh, probation, and he violated the terms of his probation just so that he wouldn't have to spend the winter outdoors. He was living in a cardboard box under a bridge in Pittsburgh. And I, I walked into my room one day, and there's James sitting on his bunk. And I, I said, oh, I said, hi, are you the new guy? He said, yeah, James. He put out his hand. I shook his hand. I said, John, nice to meet you. And he said, John, I got to tell you right off the bat, he said, I have serious mental illness. When I'm on my meds, I'm okay. When I'm off my meds, I'm crazy. And I just want to be straight with you up front. I said, well, I appreciate it, James. Thanks for telling me. I said, we have a good room here. I'll introduce you to the other guys. And I got to tell you, never in my life did I think that I would be friends with a mentally ill homeless man. But James had a fantastic sense of humor. He worked harder than every, anybody I knew in prison. And he was just an all-around good guy. But one of the problems in, in prison, not just in my prison, but in any American prison, it's been well documented by outlets like the New York Times and ProPublica, is that the Bureau of Prisons does not like giving medication to its prisoners because medication is expensive. Well, James was only in on a probation violation. So he came in in October and he was going to leave in March. And they thought, well, we're not going to medicate this guy for six months and he's just going to leave. So they cut off his medication. 
Well, when somebody is a violent, paranoid schizophrenic, you can't just cold turkey cut off their medications. What they ended up giving him was Tylenol. Every time he would complain, he'd go down to medical and complain, and they would give him Tylenol and send him back. Uh-huh. And so um, he went nuts. And it got to the point where they finally took him and they threw him in um, solitary. And a Mexican guy that I knew who happened to be in solitary at the same time and got out a month later told me um, what had happened to James. Uh, one night he stood on his bunk and he took off his slipper and he used it to hit the uh, sprinkler mm-hmm. in his cell. That set off the sprinklers in all the cells in solitary, right? There were 65 prisoners in solitary, and he flooded the place. So what they did is they called in a, a they called a an incident response team. It's like a SWAT team. They're all dressed in black. They're all wearing stab vests and bulletproof, you know, Kevlar and force clothes. And they went into the into the cell and they beat him to a bloody pulp. That's awful. And then they stripped him naked, and then they put him outside. In, in this exercise cage. It's like a large dog cage that you just walk around in circles for an hour a day. That's your exercise. Well, it was 10 degrees Fahrenheit um, when, when they did this. It was January in the mountains of western Pennsylvania or central Pennsylvania. And so at first he apologized. He asked if he could come back inside. They left him out there. And this Mexican told me that after about an hour he started crying and begging to be let back in. And then finally he passed out. And it was when he went unconscious they finally brought him back in. Uh, but that's, that's typical. That's not something that's unusual, unusual or actionable in an American prison. That kind of thing happens all the time. And nobody ever does anything about it. It's such a pity that no one does anything about it since we should make a change. And what would your solution to prison abuse be? Well, number one, there has to be accountability, and there is no accountability. You know, I I actually went and looked up the uh, the internal regulations on staff misconduct when I was in prison. You know, guards curse us constantly. It's constant swearing and filthy names, and and that is illegal. Yeah, it is. Not allowed to do that. In fact, the first time they do it, um, they get uh, a warning letter that remains in their personnel file for three years. The second time, they're suspended without pay for 14 days. The oh. third time, they're supposed to be suspended without pay for 30 days. And the, the final time is they're fired. What? Uh, that never, ever, ever happens. If I report somebody for swearing at me, wh- what are they going to say? Who are you going to believe? Are you going to believe the uniformed officer or are you going to believe this criminal? Right. And what they do when they give prisoners beatings, and this happened several times while I was in prison, um, they'll pull you into something called a dead spot. You know, there are cameras everywhere, over, all over the prison, all over every prison. But every prison has an area, a corner, a nook and a cranny, underneath the stairs, for example, where there are no cameras. And so they'll pull you down there, and they'll beat you into unconsciousness. And then they'll say, oh, you were involved in a fight, or they'll say that you fell down the steps. It's never on them. That happens all the time until there's real accountability, until prison guards are charged with felonies. There's not going to be any change. I'll give you another example. Please do so. Thank you. I was in prison for about a week, and um, I got called into the lieutenant's office, which was a shock. And I was, I was told very early on to fear being called to the lieutenant's office because it only meant you were being sent to solitary. Well, I had only been there, I think it was actually five days, and I hear my name, Kiriaku, report to the lieutenant's office. I said, oh, my God. I told the guy I was with, I said, here's my wife's phone number. If I don't come back, tell her I went to solitary and call my attorney. So I go to the lieutenant's office, and um, they've got the picture of of another prisoner up on a computer. And one of the officers says to me, do you know this guy? I said, I don't know him. I said, I met him last night. They said, well, what'd you say to him? I said, I told him, nice to meet you. Well, what did he say to you? Mm -hmm. He said, nice to meet you. I shook his hand. I walked away. They They said, well, he's the, he's the uncle of the Times Square bomber. And after you 
introduced yourself. He called a number in Pakistan, and they told him to kill you. I said, come on. I said, I could kill this guy with my thumb. They said, no, no, don't do that. We've been looking for a reason to ship him to another prison. Just stay away from him. I said, all right. Uh-huh. Every time I passed this guy in the hall, I'd kind of give him, you know, the stink eye, right? Like, uh-huh. I, know, I know who you are, buddy. And he would give me, you know, odd looks, too. But the more I thought about this, the more I thought, this doesn't make any sense. Why would the uncle of the Times Square bomber be in a low-security prison? He should be in a maximum security penitentiary. And I said, besides, the only reason I introduced myself to this guy was because he spoke Arabic, and I speak Arabic. Oh, I see. So I told him, Tasharaf bimareftek, it's nice to meet you. Uh-huh. I said, the Times Square bomber was Pakistani, and they don't speak Arabic in Pakistan. Yeah, that's true. So this didn't make any sense to me. So I went up to him on the prison yard, and I said, hey, listen, did the cops say anything to, to you about me? And he said, yeah. They called me into the lieutenant's office, and they said that after, after we met, that you called a number in Washington, and they told you to kill me. I said, they told me that you called a number in Pakistan, and they told you to kill me. I said, you see what they did? I see. They set, they set us up <laughs> so that one of us would attack the other and maybe kill the other. Oh, my. Okay, that's a federal felony. Isn't that's it? conspiracy to commit violence on federal property. That's a, I looked it up. That's a felony punishable by up to five years in prison. I so I reported it. Yeah. Well, the warden called me into his office. Thank you so much for reporting this. We're going to do a thorough investigation. Well, guess what? Mm-hmm. The investigation was of me. Oh, my. Not of the cops. <laughs> so they began, um, they, they put a five-day delay on my incoming and outgoing emails. Oh. They listened to all my phone calls in real time for the rest of my prison sentence. And they read both my outgoing and incoming mail. And, and those crooked cops were never punished in any way. I was the only one who was punished. Is this the justice system or the injustice system? <laughs> well, exactly, exactly right. And, you know, what's really sad is the Bureau of Prisons is the largest bureau within the Justice Department. Yeah. And it's also, it also has the largest budget of any a bureau in the Justice Department. It's a $7 billion budget, which is more than a quarter of the entire budget for the, for the justice system. You would think that we would have, um, you know, the, the best and brightest working to make this, this system work. You know, I, I, read, a, I read a fascinating um, statistic recently, uh, and it's been published in the Washington Post, the New York Times, elsewhere. The United States has 5% of the world's population, and it has 25% of the world's prison population. Mm-hmm. That's just unacceptable. Yes. There, there, there's a wonderful book out. It was written by a Harvard law professor by the name of Harvey Silverglade. Okay. It's called Three Felonies a Day. And Silverglade argues that we are so over-criminalized and so over-regulated and over-legislated in our country that the average American on the average day going about his normal business commits three felonies. Mm-hmm. With the bottom line being, if they really want to get you, they're going to get you, and there's nothing you can do to protect yourself. That's sad. It's sad. It seems as well. But when you look at the prisons, what was happening in prisons, it's just dreadful. I can't understand why that's happening when it's supposed to be the freedom. It's scandalous. The New York Times Magazine in May published a, a very lengthy article on the um, conditions inside the Supermax uh, prison in, right. um, in Colorado. Florence, Colorado. Mm-hmm. And they, they shadowed one inmate in solitary who was so mentally ill, he was so insane, that he actually ate glass, right? He was eating glass. Glass. And they determined, yeah. only because they didn't want to medicate him and they didn't want to take him to a doctor, they determined that he did it um, to uh, get attention that he didn't do it because he was mentally ill. And it shredded his stomach. And this is a guy with 
with a decade of documented mental illness, but they just simply didn't want to take him to a doctor. And, and that happens in American prisons every single day. People die in American prisons every single day because of abuse and because of an utter lack of medical care. Yes, these stories need to come out more. Like, they need to be expressed because... Of- yeah, it, it, because nobody knows and nobody and nobody cares is really the sad part. I'll tell you another story too. My bunkmate, my bunkmate um, was a 67-year-old man who's the former Auditor General of Cuyahoga County, Ohio. Right? He was he was the number two ranking elected official in Cleveland, Ohio, and he was a candidate, uh, potential candidate for governor of Ohio. So he got involved in a in a uh, uh, corruption case and came to prison. So here's a guy, he's already had heart surgery, he has raging out of control diabetes, and he said to me one day, I'm really not feeling well. He said, I have pain all down my left arm, I feel like somebody's sitting on my chest. I said, my God, Frank, you're having a heart attack. Let me take you down to medical. You gotta address this right now. And I actually had baby aspirins in my locker, I I take a baby aspirin every day, so I gave him some baby aspirins. So after um, count time where they count all of us, I took him down to medical. They said, you can only come to emergency medical from 6 to 6.15 a.m. He's going to have to wait until tomorrow. I said, I think he's having a heart attack. He's going to have to wait till tomorrow, 6 to 6.15 a.m. That's the only time you can go with an emergency. I actually broke my finger on my on my first week during my first week in prison and they made me wait until the next day from 6 to 6 15 a.m. and then it was 14 days before they even did an x-ray anyway I take him the next morning 6 to 6 15 a.m. say we think he's having a heart attack they said no you're not having a heart attack here's some Tylenols yeah. Yeah. so I told him Frank let's go outside maybe some fresh air would help I'll walk around the track with you. He said, I can't walk around the track. I said, we'll go really slowly. So we start walking around the track. He's winded. He can't even finish one lap around the track. So I told him, you got to go back to medical, and you have to tell them you're having a heart attack. He kept telling them over and over and over, I'm having a heart attack. I'm having a heart attack. They wouldn't even do the basic EKG. Finally, a couple of weeks later, Mm -hmm. um, I, I slept in. And I woke up around, I guess it was around 9 o'clock, roll out of bed, and I'm walking down toward the bathroom to wash my face. And there's a guy down there who sees me, and he says, yo, John, he said, your buddy Frank, uh, he's in bad shape. I said, what do you mean? Mm-hmm. He said, um, he just dropped in medical this morning from a massive heart attack. They had to do CPR to bring him back, and they took him in an ambulance. I was furious. Yeah. Because we've been telling them for weeks that he was having a heart attack. Well, he ended up spending a month in the hospital, chained to a bed in the hospital, I might add. Oh. Um, he had open heart surgery, and then they transferred him to a prison hospital in Massachusetts, 15 hours away from his family. Yeah. Now, all of this could have been dealt with. Yeah, it could have. With medication. Or with an angioplasty or something, or a stent, which they do like this, you know, every day. But they just did not want to treat the guy. They just were were hoping that either the problem would go away or he would drop dead. Let me tell you, I'm sorry I'm I'm taking up all your time, but I'm going to tell you one other thing. Please tell us. I used to work in the chapel. I was an orderly in the chapel. And um, there was a guy who I was sort of semi-friendly with who lived across the hall from the chapel. He was... Not elderly, but he was, you know, in his late 60s, an Italian guy from Boston. And I saw him one day, and I said, hey, Richie, how you doing? And he said, man, my back is killing me. I said, oh, man, I have back problems, too. I I stretch and, you know, massage and all these different things. He said, no, I mean, my back is like I've never felt pain like this before. And I said, you should go down to the medical, see if they'll give you something for the pain. You know, at least they'll give you the 800 milligram Tylenol. So he went down to the medical unit, and they gave him, sure enough, the 800 milligram Tylenols. Well, his back got worse, and I saw him again a week or so later. I said, how you doing? He said, I can't get around. He was actually using a cane. He said, I can't get around. I've I've never experienced pain like this before. Mm -hmm. 
I said, man, you got to file a complaint against medical. Just go back down there and tell them that you're not leaving until somebody helps you. So then another week passes, and I see him with a walker. Mm -hmm. And I said, my God, Richie, what happened? He said, they gave me a walker. He said, the, the pain in my back is so bad, I just can't. I can't even get out of bed. He actually began, like, soiling himself because he couldn't make it to the bathroom on time because his back hurt so much he couldn't pull himself out of bed. Finally, one day, we're in a staff meeting at the chapel, and the chaplain says, oh, I've got to stop by and see Richie. He's not doing well at all. I said, yeah, I saw him the other day. He was in a walker. He said, well, now he's in a wheelchair, and the guy's just, like, unable to move. I said, chaplain, this has been going on for, like, a month. Medical won't do anything to help this poor guy's pain. Can you weigh in with them and at least get him to a hospital to get an x-ray? Well, he did. The chaplain did. He went down to medical and complained. They took him to the hospital. They gave him an x-ray. He had stage 4 cancer in his spine, and he was dead two weeks later. Oh, that's so sad. And all these... And that happened all the time. There was just no respect what? for people and, and, for their, and for their health. It was scandalous. Right, it is scandalous. How do I agree with you? And you were a good guy. You just some, said something that came from your heart that you believe strongly about. This is called freedom of speech. How can people help you? Ah, uh, thank you. That's that's a very nice thing for you to ask. Yeah. You know what? I'm at the point. I I've been out. It'll be one year ago tomorrow that I was released from prison. Um, I've been out for a year. I got a job. It's not a dream job, but it's a job. Hi. And um, and my wife's got a decent job. And although I, I told you this off air, I still owe my attorneys $880,000 <laughs> that I'll never, ever be able to. Um, but really, if, if people want to do something, they should they should help other whistleblowers. There There's a guy who's in prison now by the name of Jeffrey Sterling. Um, S-T-E-R-L-I-N-G. Jeffrey was a senior, not a senior, but he was a CIA officer at the same time that I was. And he blew the whistle on, on a, an illegal and, and, and utterly wasteful uh, uh, covert operation against the Iranians. He reported it to the Congressional Oversight Committee, which is exactly what you're supposed to do. Why? The CIA asked the Justice Department to charge him with nine felonies, which they did. They charged him with seven counts of espionage, and two counts of theft of government property, which was the information. He stole it in his head, they said. Um, they presented no evidence other than metadata. Mm -hmm. um, and the metadata showed that he had had, over the course of five years, he had had 52 phone calls with a New York Times reporter. Well, in fact, he had filed a, a civil suit against the agency for race discrimination. Mm -hmm. And he had a strong case. Yeah. The reporter was covering the race discrimination suit, so it only made sense that they were talking on the phone. Well, somebody leaked this information to the New York Times, and they said, well, it must have been him. Uh, he had an axe to grind because we passed him over for promotion. There was no evidence. There were no intercepted phone calls. There were no intercepted emails. There were no text messages. There was absolutely, absolutely nothing to indicate that he had leaked this information to the New York Times. Yeah. But in the court where he was tried, the Eastern District of Virginia, where I was tried, mm -hmm. call it the espionage court. Nobody ever wins in the espionage court. Well, he decided to go to trial because he had not done anything wrong and he was going to defend himself. Again, you never win in the Eastern District of Virginia. And he was found guilty on all counts. So he was facing um, 45 years in prison. Uh, the judge gave him three and a half. Um, she should have just let him go home. In the meantime, his wife lost her job. They lost their home. He lost his pension. He lost everything. And then just to give him one final good screwing, they sent him 1,500 miles away from his family. Now, the, the rule in the Bureau of Prisons is they have to put you within 500 miles of your family unless there's an issue related to safety where they have to send you far away for their own safety or for your safety. They do it. They did it just to screw him. So he's at the Federal Correctional Facility in uh, Englewood, Colorado. 
Again, his name is Jeffrey Sterling. 130,000 people have signed a petition asking President Obama to pardon him. Uh, and there's an event at the National Press Club on February 17th to present the petition to the White House. I'm going to speak at that event, actually. But if anybody needs any help right now, it's Jeffrey Sterling and his wife, Holly. Well, then please help him. He needs all the help and, and help as much as possible because it is a serious issue and these issues are happening today and we need to make a change before it's too late. Yeah, that's right. And there are many teens that are going, that are my age, that are going to go to college. Would you recommend them to become CIA agents? Would you ever, uh -huh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, this is going to sound crazy, but my answer to you is yes, I would. And the reason I would is because I'm a realist and I understand that the CIA is not going away anytime soon. So the only way that you can change the CIA, it's actually twofold. One, you can get elected to Congress, get yourself appointed to the uh, House or Senate Intelligence Committee, and effect change. More realistically, you can get hired at the CIA. And right around year 10, a lot of people's careers really start to take off. A lot of people who are listening to us right now who apply and get hired are going to find themselves in positions in the next 15 or 20 years where they really can make changes inside the CIA, where they can affect policy, and they can say, we're not going to do this anymore. We're not going to do that anymore. That's the way to make change in the CIA from the inside. Exactly. Yeah, you have such a brilliant point, and I have to agree with you 100%. That everybody needs to make a change, and like you have to go inside and make the change, and that's what it is. Mm -hmm. You really do. You have to do it from the inside. And after everything that you have gone through, would you blow the whistle again if you were in the position to do so? Oh, absolutely, yes. Absolutely, yes. The price was high, don't get me wrong. But, you know, somebody had to stand up and say, this is wrong and we need to do something about it. I, I'm disappointed that, that others didn't follow me, that others didn't come out um, after I came out and say, he's right, we shouldn't be torturing anybody. That never happened. Um, but still, I'm glad that I did it because now a ban on torture is the law of the land. And I'd like to think that I played some small role in that. Me too. And, and a lot of people probably will get very inspired with you because I am. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So please, please be so kind to give us your website and other social medias. Huh. Sure, thank you. The website is www.johnkiriaku.com. It's J-O-H-N-K-I-R-I-A-K-O-U.com. Yes, and your social medias, Facebook and Twitter? Yeah, Facebook, uh, you know, John Kiriaku, and Twitter, at John Kiriaku. It's all pretty easy, Facebook. pretty straightforward, yeah. Do that, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> I would really like to thank you for coming on to Crystal Kids TV. It was an honor and a pleasure to interview you, and I would Thank like to invite you to, to another interview in the near future. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Yes. You're a real hero. Yes. Thanks and, a lot. And your story is, is needs to be talked about more. I, I hope so. Thank you. Yes. Thank you for listening to Crystal Kids TV. I would like to thank everyone for listening. Thank you, Conscious Consumer Network, for giving me a chance to, to broadcast on your wonderful network. You can check out my website, www.crystalkidsradio.com or www.crystalkidstv.com for more. You can also like my Facebook page, Crystal Kids Radio, or follow me on Twitter by searching up Crystal Kids TV or on Allie Marie Hot. Google Plus. See you next week at the same time, same place. Love, peace, and harmony. Love you all. Thank you. Thank you for tuning into CCN. This unique network is dedicated to free and independent media. CCN was created with the belief that information is the common heritage of all beings, which is why our live stream high definition broadcast is easily accessible and free to view. If we want to change the world, we must first change the media. Having produced over a thousand shows in 2015, which are all archived on YouTube, we look forward to bringing you more groundbreaking, cutting-edge information in 2016. For more information on what is on, please check out our broadcast guide for weekly updates. 
CCM broadcasts in multiple languages and features some key voices of our challenging times who are all in pursuit of a free, fair, just, sustainable world. CCM belongs to you, the people, and it is up to you all to keep this network on the air. Please contribute to the Network Support Fund or visit the CCN shop. We thank you all for supporting free and independent media.